please make your intention. Would you like to be so kind to sit down? I'm going to get started as we have a very long and intense program. So we need to have every minute of it that is assigned. First of all, I would kindly welcome you, both of you who are in the audience and those who are um, attending online to the pre-event of the panel design for inclusivity of the UIS science track taking place in Copenhagen July next year. And I would like to start with thanking for Aarhus School of Architecture for hosting us, especially um, our rector, Torben Nielsen, head of research, um, Thomas Bo Jensen, and Christian koch ramsik who were all very um, supportive during the last few years that we were organizing this. I would also like to thank the, the organizers of the Architecture Festival for including us with open arms. And of course, um, thanks to the organizing committee of the UIA, especially um, Panille Bernheim and Mette Ram Damsko um, for their ongoing support. And last but not least, I would like to thank very warm-heartedly my wonderful colleagues, um, Magda Mustafa from um, American University in Cairo, who is co-chairing this panel together with me, and to the Celli Laplace Vesende, a PhD at our school who was a lot more than just an organizer in this in the past. So thank you very much to all of you. I have very limited time, so I would like to just focus on two key aspects which started Magda and myself to, to get this whole thing about the science track for the panel of design for inclusivity running. The first one was that we felt, or we are, it's not that we only feel that we are strongly convinced that um, our built environment as it is right now is anything but inclusive. We feel that the current design norms are limiting because they are normative and most often they center around a six foot tall white male who at some point was the role model for building up these norms according to which we nowadays in many ways create our environment. And historically, that excluded all those of us who are um, outside that norm. And this is something um, we felt we really have to radically change and our panel should contribute to that change. So, and then the second kind of issue we brought up or that was important for us, that this, what we want to create here is not just about um, creating solutions in architecture such as accessibility or very often when it comes to um, to inclusivity, when we go about the gender debate, the first thing that comes to mind is the bathrooms. So this is not, even though we think it's important, but this is not what we want to tackle here. We really want to um, radically change how we conceive of our built environment and also the realities that we as designers are confronted with and the framework we create um, with our um, creations. So we want to bring about a change in thinking and a change in looking at those groups who have been historically excluded. Um, Next slide. 
Yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah. yeah. So um, we created a call for papers. And in that call, we addressed seven different categories, if you want to call it like that. Um, gender, race, ethnicity, and minorities, poverty and socioeconomy, age, ability, the non-human, and the neurodiversity. So these are categories as we pointed them out, which we think have been historically outside that norm and therefore have been underrepresented. But what is very important, and that's like the second key issue that we want to um, point out is that we would like to work intersectionally. That means that we don't want to put people or our, our works into one category or the other because there is no human being who is either one or that. We are all a, a mixture of these different um, categories. And that's why it's very important for us to also conceive of our work as an intersection of all of these different things. So what we organized for you today is a panel with protagonists who give out statements um, in relation to these topics we put up. But then in consequence, after a short intermission, we would like to discuss these statements and we would like to discuss with you what that means for the future design. So I would briefly like to introduce the panel. We have Chris Downey visiting us from the West Coast of the US. He's an architect um, working for the last 35 years and since 2008 without sight and um, that he wants to leverage this ultra perspective as a consultant <laughs> and as an educator of architecture, also specializing now in universal design. Then we have Charlotte Malter Bates, um, currently visiting us from um, Switzerland, as I understand, but originally from Belgium. She's an architect who says, quote about herself that she is maintaining a militant and political and spatial practice of feminist activities. She's the co-founder and member of the Parity Group, a grassroots association aiming at improving gender equality and diversity in architecture education and the profession. Then we have online with us, Jordan Whitewood Neal, He's an architect and an artist whose work addresses disability, domesticity, pedagogy, and cultural infrastructure. And he's co-leading a design think tank at London School of Architecture on retrofitting as a process of civic reparation. Um, reparation. Then we have Lily Ka on our panel. She's an architect with a background in natural science. Her work explores how architecture practices can be attentive to the material, social, legal, and ecological byproducts of design spatial transformation. We have again um, online Angela Mingas, an architect, an architect trained also in pedagogy and um, anthropo anthropology of space with a particular interest of theory of African architecture. And um, An Angela also worked as an advisor to spatial politics in Luanda, Angola. And then um, Magda, Mustafa, um, the co-chair of the panel is joining us. She's an architect and also an educator 
focusing on autism and inclusive design, and she's leading the autism design at Progressive Architects. Um, last but not least, we have a moderator for our um, event, who is Nikolai Karlberg from uh, um, Copenhagen. He's an ethnologist and an advisor to governments, foundations, private and third sector agency, agencies on how to tackle inequality and improve quality of life for neurodivergent and disadvantaged people. So we are very um, proud of the program we created for you. And um, I just briefly want to point out again, um, the call for papers, because this is what we are advertising here. We are looking for your um, contributions here. You have the key dates, and here you also have um, the logo for getting the information, what is important for us. And now I'm, I'm kind of confused by my own notes. <laughs> what is important for us is um, on the one hand, the audience we attract in this call, it's not supposed to be only dry scientific papers. Architecture is a very diverse um, discipline and diverse is also its mode of expression. So we want to um, include um, authors such as curators, architects, urbanists, all kind of um, people who contribute to create the built environment, but then it's also really important for us to get contributions in various different formats, such as narrative essays, scholarly essays, um, photo essays. So um, we really hope to get a variety of contribution that reflects the diversity and the variety of our built environment. Thank you very much. Um, now I would like to give over to Nikolai. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, and uh, good morning to you all. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm very honored to have the chance to moderate this dialogue on such an important issue and with such an amazing panel and organizers from all around the world. It's really a pleasure. Um, and thank you all for coming here this morning, this early, and all of you watching online, welcome to you as well. Ruth just told us why we're here. Um, and my hope is that you, the audience, um, will walk away from here enlightened and uh, with a new, deeper, and definitely more complex understanding of these issues. Um, and the need for an architecture of social justice. Hopefully you will feel a bit empowered and um, ready to continue the discussion and uh, maybe even to start acting. Um, besides being a great honor, uh, I must admit that it also feels a bit challenging to be moderating this discussion. Like uh, many of you in this room, I won't have the the privilege of having my native tongue available for me today. Um, so just bear with me if I say something which doesn't make sense at all. Um, and even though I work with inclusive design on a daily basis, um, I just know that I still have so much to learn by listening to the panel today and people like you in this room um, with very different professional and personal experiences. So my hope is that we all can help each other to make the panel feel very welcome and safe and comfortable sharing their stories and opinions with us for the next couple of hours. Um, but before we start, I would just like to uh, see who's in the room a little bit. Um, so um, I would like all of you um, who are not architect, and not an architect or not a student of architecture to raise your hands. Okay, we have a little minority here. <laughs> Great. Uh, then I would like those of you not living in Aarhus to raise your hands. 
greater minority. Yeah. And finally, <laughs> those of you not having Danish as your native tongue, raise your hand. Okay, excellent. Three minorities. I must say, based on this uh, little poll, this uh, event is for um, architects, Danish architects living in Aarhus. Uh, no, it's of course not. It's for all of you. It's for everyone in the room. So now it is time to um, invite our first speaker uh, on the floor and uh, for a protagonist statement. And as our dear speaker, or, uh, as, uh, um, yeah, and as our uh, dear speakers are already formally introduced by Ruth, uh, I will just um, give you, uh, invite you all to give a warm welcome to our first speakers, uh, which is Chris Downey, uh, and who will talk on the perspective of uh, sensual disability. Chris. The work is yours. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Excuse me. Hello, everybody. Let me start my timer. Okay, now I'm good. Got my timer going, so I won't be up here all day long. <laughs> so, um, thank you for that introduction. Thank you, Nikolai, and thank you, Ruth. And uh, not to confuse everybody, when Ruth des described how uh, this this discussions were to be about, uh, you know, getting away from the uh, white uh, six foot tall male. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. <laughs> where we start, that's where we start. But to that extent, I used to be on the inside, that in group, the six foot tall white male, looking to the outside, not fully getting it. One day I woke up, with no sight at all, and being on the outside, looking in, and consider, re reconsidering all sorts of things, from how to work, to what does it mean, how to get around, and uh, all sorts of things that we don't have time for. But uh, through that journey, I took as a fascinating adventure. Actually, I've come to realize it was almost like a fulfillment or continuation of my architectural uh, education. So I am trained as an architect, uh, two degrees in architecture, undergraduate at North Carolina State University, graduate at UC Berkeley. But in my undergraduate time, I spent six months studying in Copenhagen as part of the Danish International Studies. So it's like coming home. You know, I did visit Aarhus at that time. Uh, so, uh, and I do continue to practice now as an architect without sight since 2008 uh, in, a pro uh, in work focusing on projects for the blind and people with low vision, but all sorts of disabilities, other sensory disabilities, other uh, physical disabilities and neurodiversity. So it's uh, really been quite a, a, a wonderful opportunity to really dive deeply into that area and really embrace that as part of my practice. I also teach uh, periodically at UC Berkeley and last spring had the, uh, the privilege of serving as the inaugural visiting professor of practice in social justice, uh, discussing many of these topics. So uh, I wanna turn more into the actual work, not a whole lot, but on the screen, you see uh, an image of me reading some, some drawings in tactile form. So much of my this, ex, this experience has been about transforming the practice of architecture. How can you do that without sight? How we work, we work with drawings. So obviously, how do you read those if you can't see? Uh, luckily, uh, today I have the benefit of uh, large format embossing printers so I can print, print drawings in tactile form. It can include braille, all sorts of things so I can read it. Uh, and it's a, a really transformative technology and media to work with. And it, it not only provides me access into the profession, but in using those documents, using those tools, I've been able to use that with clients that I'm working with, with stakeholders, other people that are blind, to be able to read the drawings and, and give them access, not just into the architecture, but into the process. 
giving them agency over the work that they oversee, the work that they do in their role in that or with that organization. Uh, but not only is it about accommodation or access, there are things that are remarkable benefits. What I found in reading these drawings is quite different than what I experienced with sight. But sight, your eyes get all you know, overwhelmed with how beautiful, how amazing the drawing is. Yeah, you know, what a great composition, uh, how wonderful it all looks. And you kind of forget to get inside that space, to be inside the drawing, imagining being in that space, inside the model, whatever it is, and then inhabiting that as a person, putting the human body in that space. So what I found is remarkable about working with tactile drawings is where my finger touches the paper, that's where I am. I'm transposed to that point of contact, being in the space, imagining all the materials around me, the materials on the floor, where the sun comes through the window, how it hits the back of my neck, uh, the sounds of the space. I'm imagining it visually as well. I still think visually. In my mind, I can think and design visually. And imagining all the sensory experiences and not just the composition, but actually moving through the space as a composition in time as well. So um, it's quite a, a, a wonderful way of experiencing and working within architecture. So next slide, please. This next slide is an image of a project I worked on in San Francisco, the San Francisco Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. It's an organization that serves people with, uh, that have experienced sight loss. And I wanted to share with you a, a number of things about this uh, project. It's a, sort of a deep exploration into design for those with limited or, or uh, no sight. So with that, it's multi-sensory. You're not just designing for the eyes. You have to design for the eyes as well, but you have to design for how the space sounds, how it feels underfoot, the kind of information you get by using a cane as your cane passes on the floor and picking up landmarks and cues, all sorts of things to, to map and know the space, uh, not just getting around safely. But it's about all sorts of things, but it's also in the work that I do, I try to imagine, so what brings a delight in architecture? If you think about the three books of uh, Vitruvius, firmness, commodity, and light, delight. Where, how, what's delight? in architecture if you can't see it. So it's also about the haptic experience, what your hand touches. So how can you convey that sense of, of uh, delight through that immediate bodily encounter with things that you know people are gonna grab, the handrail, the doorknob, lean over a rail, lean against the wall, really imagining and designing that to welcome the human body in a delightful way. Uh, so, um, in here, there's, there's a lot of things also about visual accessibility, trying to, to design for people with limited sight, low vision conditions. So in the slide, perhaps you can see uh, no, nosings on the stair treads that are uh, stainless steel providing high visible, high visible contrast to the wood risers and stairs. Uh, so you can see them for those with low vision conditions uh, without those steel, stainless steel nosing strips it would just like look like a solid block of wood for many people with low vision conditions. So it's about providing visual access to the space as well. Uh, next slide. And finally, my time's just about up. Something totally different, but it's something I like to use as sort of a metaphor for inclusive design. And that is- Sorry, I just sorry. need to- Is that working? Yeah, sorry. And here it is. Oh. So uh, something totally different, rowing. What does that have to do with this? I take this as one of the most incredible inclusive design demonstrations. I'm in this boat. Uh, I'm a competitive rower. I can't see. I'm only a person on the team without with a disability. And I can, I'm just another person in the boat. How can that happen? Well, if you notice, nobody's looking where they're going. We're all looking the wrong way. <laughs> so, so we're even. But what's remarkable about it is it's a multi-century sport. I don't need to see. I can hear when the blades, the other competitors, their blades are hitting the water. I can feel the motion of the seats as they go back and forth. I can feel the balance. Uh, I have the benefit of proprioception, muscle memory, 
knowing how to do things repeatedly and sort of match the technical uh, skills. So it's, uh, there's so much that goes into it, but it's not just that it's accessible, it's inclusive. It's part of a team. It's not being isolated, it's being fully integrated as a team, all going in and working together. And I think if we can take that as a metaphor for architecture, for inclusive architecture, it's how to get us all into the boat together, working together, providing those, the, the sensory environments, the accommodations. I've been road with people with missing limbs, people in neuro, neurodiversity, and, and trying to bring in all sorts of people into that boat to work together, to be fully integrated, working towards a common shared goal which could even just be like the quality of life itself. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Chris, for, uh, for ending on this beautiful metaphor, the multi-sensual world and, and the, the world imagined as a road boat. Um, we will get back to your uh, key points and, and arguments later in the discussion. And uh, maybe you have already guessed it, but now we are in session one and uh, we have these uh, short presentations from all the panelists uh, around uh, the late minutes. And, and then we will have a short break and then we will continue with the panel discussion up here. And uh, of course you are very welcome to just take notes, uh, during the presentations and prepare some questions. And then we will, uh, during the panel discussion, invite you all to, to ask uh, questions as well. Um, so now we will just uh, quickly jump to our next uh, speaker. And um, Charlotte, that is you. So um, please, um, you are going to talk about the perspective of gender inequality. And um, yeah, just a warm welcome to Charlotte. Thank you. I'm going to follow Chris' uh, best practice and time myself. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, I would just like to talk a little bit about uh, parity and diversity work uh, and activism in design institution in the frame of this panel, which I think makes a lot of sense. I would like to acknowledge that this is a collective work um, done with people like Dubrovka Sekulic, Sarah Nichols, Daniela Ortiz Dos Santos, Gabriel Shad, Kostan Lange, Kenzani de Clerc, Amy Perkins, and many more who have been doing this work with me in various institutions. Um, so to address gender inequality in the way space is designed, the battle actually starts in design institutions, but only if and when institutions acknowledge that their origin is grounded in racism, classism, and patriarchy, basically exclusion, can there be a possibility to transform institutional design through spatial design? And this change has to happen where it matter, uh, matters more, most for the future in how we teach it. Uh, there has been attempts to conduct, conduct such uh, ambitious changes. Uh, they have happened, they are ongoing, and they will happen further. Um, will they go to um, so to unpack the complexities inherent to these efforts, the work of the parity group uh, at the architecture department of the Swiss Institute of Technology, where I um, previously uh, was um, a teaching assistant is a telling example. Uh, so what you see here is two uh, images, one that shows um, a group of white men in suits looking at a model and below it says architecture then. And then the next image is, uh, a group of white men, uh, some of them in suits, so there are some changes, some of them without suits, most of them, all of them are actually white men are looking at a model and that's architecture now. Um, so <clears throat> just to kind of uh, jump back into this discussion about the work at the architecture department, what started as a local rebellion against very much that images, those images you see here, uh, white male academia, quickly turn into articulating a political agenda, demanding profound corrections to architecture education with the ambition of carrying these into the profession and the industry. Um, we started back in 2014, the situation was very bleak. All male juries were a sad recurring 
banality and those who complained were a marginalized minority. Despite a fairly diversified uh, and gender balanced student body, diverse faculty was non-existent with female professors an exception. Blatant sexism and racism, social injustice, classism, and lack of diverse representation were rampant in that institution, but I believe this is something that applies to others, unfortunately. Um, these appalling conditions triggered a grassroots movement among teaching assistants, doctoral students, and junior researchers within the architecture department was, was to become the parity group, a politicized fluid in-house body that grew to include staff and students and a few professors, and is still intensively active to this day, fully committed to changing the situation towards parity and diversity in the uh, conservative context of architecture education in Switzerland by deploying what we've come to call institutional activism. So what you see here are three posters, um, and I will also maybe mention, perhaps in the discussion, how we've also um, come to be critical of those, but those are um, three posters that show um, Semper, Le Corbusier, and Herzog and Demorand in drag um, as a way to kind of interrogate um, the canon. Now, hundreds of hours of free labor went into the organization work that created a remarkable space for dissent, conflict, accountability, and negotiation, allowing for other groups to emerge inside and outside of the institution, challenging hierarchies, teaching methods, and pedagogical content. Um, an output of the parity talk, so these events basically uh, was um, uh, productive in the sense that what came out of it um, was uh, nine points for parity, which was asking for a parity board, uh, monitoring of all um, professorships, uh, events, um, hiring uh, staff um, and then asking for parity and diversity in professorships, in lectureships, in senior researchers, in assistants, in guest critics and seminars and juries, which was a, a, a let's say a point of contention. Parity in all search committees that would hire professors, integration of gender matters in curriculum and research, and a few other points um, that I don't dwell into. Uh, this was re re relatively successful. Uh, the Parity and Diversity Commission was created, which was then um, basically uh, enshrined in the statutes of the departments towards um, guaranteeing or at least um, pushing for change. Um, grounded within the larger struggle for diversity um, in architecture, stressing the importance of sharing information, creating tactics and strategies within the institution the parity group evolved from demanding gender parity at all events and in the hiring of professor, uh, professors, uh, very much an unachieved goal, unfortunately, to articulating an intersectional agenda of which curriculum change is an angle stone. And one of the many outputs of this work is seeking to expand the parity conversation beyond the school to other schools, the profession and other disciplines to create new global networks of solidarity and common strategies. Uh, and the framework and the following steps of these efforts became what um, has been called the Parity Front, which is a spin-off shadow institution dedicated to gender equality and diversity in architecture, connecting all the groups in all architecture schools that are working um, towards this. And actually the group um, of ARIS is also part of that. Um, now to conclude in regard to this institutional activism, if many schools have shown unprecedented progress, with the hiring of diverse candidates, a practical deep transformation is not that tangible. While universities in general and schools of architecture in particular are pressured into presenting a facade of progressism by demands both emerging from within and outside of their structures, the deep necessary structural changes in pedagogies are not addressed. Pointing at what Olufemi Tawo discusses in Elite Capture to respond to the pressing needs of our world, it is not simply optics that need to change. In the case of architectural education, what has to be revolutionized is architecture itself. Acknowledging that the basis of architecture as common knowledge is grounded in white male supremacy means reconsidering all relations anew within and about the profession. What is at stake is unlearning as much as learning and relearning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shalada. Absolutely on time. And uh, we'll just uh, jump to our next speaker.
who uh, will be Jordan Whitewood Neil, who are with us online from London. Jordan, can you hear us? Yes, perfectly. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you perfectly fine. And, and, and thank you so much uh, for being uh, with us uh, online. I know that it's, it's due to the, to the fact that uh, the combination of your physical disability and COVID-19 actually limits your access to an event like this. But uh, we are very fortunate that uh, you can be with us online then. So please uh, welcome Jordan and um, the word is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, sad not to be there today, but it was a choice between a COVID-filled plane or a 16-hour train. So I think I made the right choice staying here today. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm an architectural researcher. Um, just to give a bit of context, my disability is a sort of a, a cocktail, really. Um, my ba base into <laughs> that cocktail is a thing called Proto syndrome, which is an overgrowth disorder I've had since birth, which is extremely rare. Um, this then le led to me having both legs amputated at the age of 13, 14, um, and then a spinal injury. So I've been in a wheelchair for the majority of my life um, and, the major and the entirety of my sort of sec higher education. Um, so over the last two years, I've been conducting research into the history of disability and domesticity at the Architectural Association and Arch Architecture School in London. Um, this research has focused on a disability-centered design course which ran in the 1990s, which was started by a disabled former tutor at the AA called Andrew Walker. Um, it was this history that truly motivated me to think about the inclusivity of design education, particularly reflecting upon my own experiences and challenges in architecture school. So sharing the same disability as Andrew Walker, funnily enough, um, his experiences and challenges although experienced as a tutor, felt very familiar. Um, so from visiting universities and their access to, the to, their, to their studios when I was looking for my first course, to being told that my disability would hold me back from fully engaging in the course itself, I felt that these barriers were sort of direct and personal injustices. So Walker faced both social and spatial barriers at the Architectural Association. Um, and we see him here and this photo which shows him in his communication studio at the AA, which was at the time in the 1990s, one of the few accessible rooms in the entire school, which stretched across several Georgian buildings. Um, so he was kind of, you know, isolated in this space and he was sort of quite reliable in that students always knew where he was. And I found this to be quite a um, poignant point about the whole, whole research. Um, so. And sadly, I believe that this experience still resonates with the experience of disabled students today. So because of all this, my work in this area has pivoted around several key initiatives that I'm currently working on to address both the contents and methods of architectural pedagogy. Um, firstly, is a module that I'm currently designing um, for a design think tank at the London School of Architecture, which will be addressing the intersection between retrofitting, disability, and cultural spaces, which will explore alternative forms of design research and mapping community networks in the city. So really introducing students to thinking about access as a pivotal part of the design process and the research process. Um, secondly, I'm working on creating a disability and architecture network that brings together and provides support for students, practitioners, and academics in the UK. Um, and then if we go to the next slide. Um, one thing I'd say I'm most proud of recently is an event I co-organized um, at the London Festival of Architecture, which brought together disabled creatives. Um, and the point of this event was to bring us together, um, a variety of disabilities, to really basically tell stories about our own experiences in the built environment. Um, it felt like a very unique space and that was sort of safe and comfortable to be able to share things that we often don't talk about, um, from abuse on trains to sensory overload on the underground, to being accosted by faith healers um, and so many different things. Um, and this actually led to the founding of a disability center collective 
that hopes to sort of negate the historical isolation and neglect of disabled voices in design discourse. So each of these projects sees social justice as a form of sort of liberation and reparation for disabled communities usually excluded from the built environment. So for me, I mean, this suggests three key obstacles for the creation of an inclusive and built and, and just built environment. The underappreciated history and experience of disabled people, access to and accessibility of architectural education, that especially in the UK at the moment creates very restrained routes to qualification, that I believe in turn limits disabled architects and designers from access and education and going through it fully. And finally, you know, creating a very narrow view of inclusive design and its impacts on wider society. So we not only need to transform the way we think of inclusive design, but how it's viewed from the outside as well. So arguably some of the more systemic causes of these obstacles are due to gaps in knowledge, such as disabled contributions to architecture, culture, and legislation. And this has been sort of one facet of my research into Andrew Walker, understanding how his course supported students who then went on to actually affect massive change in the industry. So here, the importance of disabled presence is clearly an asset to the creation of a more inclusive built environment. And so from this, I would pose on behalf of our collective three key questions that we want to respond to as an interdisciplinary collection of architects, designers, artists, and researchers. I put it forward to yourselves as well. So these are, how can we make design and planning a democratic process that draws from local and embodied experience, this being of disabled people? How can we create and increase agency and access to culture and cultural spaces that consequently make disabled communities more actively involved in the built environment? So I believe that, you know, being involved in the design process as, as a community is very important as well. And finally, how can we transform architectural education to enable more flexible and diverse forms of special practice? So overall, we want to communicate how the disabled voice in the lineage of sort of architecture is incredibly neglected yet show how disabled people who often encounter buildings in the most critical and challenging of ways are undoubtedly some of the most valuable potential voices in understanding the issues and successes at the heart of built space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you for a very inspiring uh, statement. Um, it's just amazing how you use your personal experience to, to push some of the, the, the barriers and limits in, in architecture. Thank you. Um, we will uh, now uh, get back to, um, uh, to the room here and our next panelist uh, will be Lily Carr. And um, Lily, I know you're going to remind us that uh, we are not the only living creatures on this uh, planet <laughs> and, uh, and that architecture can have some quite um, severe impact on that non-human aspect. So um, give a warm welcome to, to Lily Khan. Um, so hello. Um, so I trained as and have worked as an architect, but I'm here to share my perspective shift on an architecture for inclusivity for the non-human, having worked on a project that isn't a building um, or your kind of traditional architectural project, but rather an atlas called Feral Atlas, um, which is a project that was led by three anthropologists, um, Anna Singh, Jennifer Diga, um, Alda Kellerman Saxena, and an artist and architect, Pepe Jo. Um, and it's an interactive website that was published online um, in 2020, um, and it's accessible um, at feralatlas.org, and this is the front page of the website. Um, so Feral Atlas is an atlas um, that charts the non-designed ecological effects encouraged by landscape altering human infrastructure projects. These infrastructures help provide our energy, food, water, and material environments. An example is a city or a part of a city or a particular feature of a city such as a municipal water supply or a program of tarmacking and paving for circulation. These infrastructures are multiscalar. In doing the work they are designed to do, such as extract, process, and pipe water from one place to another, or provide a smooth surface for cars to run on, 
These infrastructures alter land, air, and water. These alterations can upset formerly stable ecologies, encouraging non-human living and non-living entities, such as plants, animals, and geological and chemical entities to run what we say out of human control. An example is the flash flooding in urban areas after heavy rain. Hard surfacing in coordination with leaf shedding trees and nest building rodents, um, an accumulation of detritus and human non-human waste um, that blocks stormwater drains, encourages water to run out of control. Um, another example is the petrochemical and the petro industrial complex that produces the plastic we need to contain and transport bulk items, and which is later discarded as waste. Trash flows downhill, writes one feral atlas author. It washes into drains and out into rivers and into the oceans, where it gets gathered and concentrated by ocean gyres um, and gathered in albatross feeding grounds, which decimates their populations through ingestion. Um, and this is a screenshot from a documentary film, um, which is uh, by documentary filmmaker Chris Jordan. It's one of the field reports contained in the Feral Atlas site. Feral Atlas argues that it is the designed work of our infrastructures in coordination with the activities and agilities of non-humans that encourages out of control ecological effects. These effects can be world ripping. So Feral Atlas brings together 79 field reports by scientists, humanists, and artists who witness and study these out of control ecological effects and how they impact on more than human lives and livelihoods in intense and often violent ways. And this is one of the reports. What each of these reports demonstrates crucially is that these effects are spatially localized. They don't occur everywhere. There is a spatial injustice to where and how these effects are felt. There is a spatial locality to the effects of our industrial ways of doing, even though the industrial infrastructures that have encouraged them, these effects may be located elsewhere. Perhaps a consequence of this dislocation, and perhaps as well a consequence of the arrogance of modernizing infrastructure projects and programs that claim mastery and control of more than human ecologies, many out of control effects go unnoticed and unattended to. And so they pile up. This piling up is the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the ecological crisis, and so on. And Feral Atlas argues that rather than simply identifying the pile, we need to start getting into it and start identifying the pieces and all their messy entanglements. In these critical times, Feral Atlas argues we need to learn urgent practices of attention to what the infrastructures we design and depend on do. So how is this relevant to architects? Um, well, I worked on Feral Atlas shortly after graduating and having had a couple of years experience working in medium sized architecture firms, which were designing and building buildings in a fairly industry standard way. While working in these firms, I became pr quickly frustrated that the buildings um, that were being designed um, were being designed with very little consideration for the landscapes within which they were being built and the non humans, as well as oftentimes the humans who were living in those places. Furthermore, little consideration was given to how those buildings, these landscape altering projects, were continuing to alter those landscapes after they were built, and how this in turn upset spatially localized ecologies. Um, working on Feral Atlas alongside working in these firms made me realize several things. First, that we increasingly seem to rely on bigger and better infrastructures to save us from environmental disasters or neglecting to consider the ecological effects of our, our existing infrastructures may encourage, and which might you know, be said to propagate said effects in the first place. Wouldn't it make more sense to start trying to understand and care what our infrastructures we're already designing and building are doing? How might they work in coordination with non-humans to propagate detrimental or desirable effects? And since ecological alterations arise from the coordination of human and non-human activities, following human plans and designs is not enough. We need to learn to be attentive and to care about the activities of non-humans too. Um, so the big question, of course, is how? 
Um, and so for those of us trained in Western academic traditions, um, working with scientists, um, I found is a good place to start. Um, scientists know how to follow the activities of non-humans <coughs> without assuming too much in advance. Um, they know how to hold their attention to scenes of world making in action. Um, in their work, in their practices as scientists, they all are already building cultures of empathy and care and attunement, the needs and demands of the non-humans they are following. But getting scientists who work in one very particular way and engineers and planners to work together to understand each other is a daunting and difficult task. So the second thing working on Feral Atlas made me realize is that this kind of collaboration is hard, but it is possible. Um, it requires something that I think architects are quite bad at, which is patience, um, and something architects are quite good at, which is working with spatial analysis in multi-sensory, compelling, and easy to understand, but accurate and precise ways. Um, I worked on an atlas and I believe that drawing and mapping are essential tasks. Um, and through this, um, learning to bridge difference in ways of looking and describing, we might not be familiar with. After all, how we look and describe, how we look at and describe the worlds we are working in, is it contingent on who we are looking at those worlds with? And how we describe and tell these worlds determines much of what we come to do and build. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. Very inspiring. And, and I can highly recommend you all to have a look into the Feral Atlas. I did that and I lost the track on time. And uh, it was interesting to actually get some uh, very concrete and, and, and visual um, visuals on, on the Anthropocene. What is it really when we talk about the Anthropocene? And here you, you actually kind of show us that it's real and it's there. You can actually see it and, and try to, to work with it. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, we are now going online again uh, to our next speaker. And it's Angela Mingers. We are so happy that you are joining us. I really don't know whether you're joining us from Angola or Lisboa today. Are you with us? I don't know if you can see me. Yes, I am. Oh, but, uh, yeah, now we can hear you, Angela. Yes, hi, how are you? Well, hi. Ali, <laughs> I, I cannot turn on my video because I think it has to be, um, I, I don't have the permission to do that. You, uh, the host, the technical team should do that, and uh, we can. You can see me. <laughs> okay, we will uh, get to that, but uh, we can yeah. hear you loud and clear, so, so you can. All right. Yeah. Okay, so I so I will begin. Yeah, so uh, yeah, first of all, it is with great pleasure that I join you on this open day, and uh, I greet my fellow panelists and. Um, the hostesses in special greeting to Riselli because she's responsible for my participation on this event. And uh, <clears throat> I, I believe you can see me right now, but so I'm going to continue. So I am an architect and I developed my work as a teacher, as a researcher, and as a social intervention agent at the Center for Studies and um, Scientific Research in Architecture at the Universidade Luzia de Angola. Uh, I'm talking to you from, uh, from Luanda. Uh, I'm right now in Angola. And um, so, let's, so let's begin. Um, so, um, I'll start with the word musek, which uh, is uh, an indigenous word name with ancestral roots and which today in my country is associated with the word, with the informal settlement. So when you hear the word musek is all that you are seeing in this image. Although the main objective and contribution of my work resides in the specific knowledge about 
these these specific areas of the, of the urban tissue that we call Bustec, there is a need to make a scientific recognition of the social, cultural, urban structure, identify the local heritage, and develop studies that allow us to understand the Musek that are the greatest urban challenge in Angola. For Luanda, the capital city, the Musek have an impact of around 49% of Luanda's urban territory and 80% of its population. They represent, by consensus, a singular fact determined by the space and time, a landscape full of historical, social, and aesthetic values of the local urban culture, whose construction resulted on the one hand from complex processes associated with slavery and colonization resulting from the Portuguese conquest and more recently to the civil war and the economic crisis already in, uh, in the independent context. But on the other hand, the dynamic and changeable character of the form of, of its elements um, fruit of the relation of appropriation and transformation of the space made by its user turned out to uh, it's, um, make the Musek this scenario of singularities. And for the most part, these Museks are territories, unfortunately, with precarious conditions of habitability and marginalized from investment and state funding. There is a real threat since public policies have been created to eliminate these territories and replace them with fanciful projects with a global profile. Uh, and uh, from our perspective as urban planning, we are talking about urban reconversion. This public policy, places more than three and a half million inhabitants in conditions of vulnerability and cultural identity. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. From this perspective, we start from the principle of the, this Indian philosopher, Jiddu Krishnamurti, who says, if we can really understand the problem, the answer will come from it because the answer is not separated from the problem itself. Uh, from, this, uh, from, this, uh, from this quote, and because these sex belong to this category of informal settlement, there is a huge void, epistemological void about how to address, how to intervene in these territories. And so the paucity of ur urban design studies about the Musex within the scope of urban morphology based on the system and morph morph morphologic morphological, I'm sorry, elements of the landscape um, uh, with emphasis on historical cases um, put us at a considerable distance from full knowledge of the historical, social, cultural and aesthetic value of these non-accredited territories. To this extent, knowledge about the Musek is an area of multidisciplinary disciplinary interest since the interpretation of, the gen of its genesis should be a hermeneutic, I'm sorry about my accent, exercise using archetypes, methodologies, and urban lexicons that still do not exist, but to be developed from other scientific fields, such as philosophy, mathematics, and even linguistics, in our case of Bantu origin, in a first and intuitive approach to the subject. Thus, finding solutions, derives from the full understanding of its dimension and elements, diving into its complexity to define its origin and thus finding the answer within the problem itself. Overcoming challenge of the non, um, of, of this reconversion of informality 
that it's an existential functional element of the city and uh, it's important for us to build in to create intervention tools from new epistemological paths uh, can we go to the last slide please um, so the field of urban planning from an intersectional perspective in which the socioeconomic issue and race are presented as inseparable dimensions to reflect on the interconnected nature of the urban exclusion of the Musex. Addressing the racialization of the urban space in Luanda starts from the point of view that it is in the territory that you can read this segregation uh, pattern that began uh, during the slavery period. And it's understood uh, from us as researcher as a colonial heritage. So the structure of the city is segregated. Okay, and it all this Im what you see in these images that you that is what we usually see as informal settlements are always in contra in contrast with those um, urban approaches designed by a scholar uh, by a scholar architecture. So this is a a, a city that it's. Uh, everywhere we go, we see the contracts between what is um, uh, a projected area of the city and what is uh, um, a self-constructed um, territory that are the Musex. But if you see it uh, at a close, um, with, a, with a magnifying lens, what you will see that you can that you can tell by the image on the on the um, on the right bottom side when you when you see the, the the cells of the city they are exactly the same but uh, but when we approach and we have this bird view on african cities is that we are talking about um, cracked, um, broken glass. You know, when you when you punch the uh, a glass surface and it cracks, and it and it's something that you don't recognize so far with our instruments to teach architecture. We don't recognize that as you know a proper a proper design, a proper urban design that can promote um, quality of life and blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So our main motivation is to create a split in the process and to understand the urban reality in Angola with the expectation of dialoguing with other thinkers and actors in the territory. Because, and this is a personal uh, view, I believe that it is urgent to change the way African cities have been represented until today and to work with instruments capable of developing the territory while preserving its social cultural narratives, not to eliminate a musex or to reconvert a musex. Sensitize the agents to think about what the construction of cities in the continent should be and interrupt the discourse of the African cities as failed, hopeless, needing help, or as cities that simply don't work. Thank you for your attention. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angela. Very inspiring, yeah. uh, very interesting. Uh, and, and, and sharing uh, your your key point on, on that we need more knowledge about these dynamics of segregation if we are to, to cope with that in a, in, in a better way. Um, we'll get back to you as well in the in the discussion. Um, but now we okay. uh, we have the very last uh, presenter, um, and it's Magda Mustafa, uh, our last protagonist, and. Um, Magda, you will talk on the perspective of uh, neurodiversity. Um, and uh, let's all give uh, uh, Magda a warm welcome. Uh, 
All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, as Nicolai kindly introduced, I'll be talking about the work of inclusivity from the lens of autism and neurodiversity specifically. And the reason I got into this field was a typical necessity is the mother of invention situation. In 2002, I was a young architect, freshly graduated. My husband and I just started our practice and we were asked to design one of the first schools for autism in the Middle East. Um, and at the time I was approached by the parents who wanted to found this school and I was a very good student. I went to my resources, naively thinking I would find a chapter just like the chapters on mobility and wheelchair use. And at the time there was more information about access for visual impairment and hearing impairment. And I thought I would find a section on autism and there was absolutely nothing. I still have a letter from the then president and director of the International Building Council inquiring if there were guidelines or best practices anywhere else in the world. And I still have a letter saying from him, I know of none and nor do we have any guidance for design for autism. So I decided to create my own. And as I said, I was a young student. I just entered my doctoral program. I'd been working for almost 18 months towards my comprehensive exam. I had a proposal that I put 18 months of work into on a completely different topic. I went to my advisor weeks away from my deadline and asked her if she would be willing for us to shift the topic to this urgent necessity that I felt we needed to address in the field. And she very bravely agreed with the caveat that I still needed to meet my deadline, which was about six weeks away <laughs> with a full proposal. And I met that deadline, so I'm here today and was able to dedicate a year of our work to partnering with this school and building up experimental classrooms, observing the children in their spaces and the teachers and working with the parents. And ultimately the result of that is what you see on the screen, which is the Aspects Autism Design Guide, which I see more of a framework. It's comprised of seven principles. Those principles are uh, acoustics, which asks us to think about spaces through the lens of what we hear more than only what we see. And in this point, maybe Chris and I, our work really intersects. It also called for the need to think about our spaces through the lens of how they are stitched together and the sequence through which we move from one space to another. And when you're on the spectrum of autism and you're navigating very much from a sensory perspective that can be very overwhelming, Predictability in space is something that's very supportive and helpful for your access to those spaces. So when you build in this logical sequencing in spaces, it becomes much more accessible and intuitive, not only for autistic users, but for everyone. The third uh, point is escape, which I had a personal experience with that I shared with Ruth and Chris. I live in Cairo, which is a very busy, noisy, intense city. And arriving in Denmark and getting on the train and admiring the silence and the sensory respect of your culture was very much an escape for me from the sensory world where I live. And that is an everyday experience for someone who's on the spectrum that everything is too loud or too bright or too rough um, or too abrupt. So as designers, we need to be aware of that and build in moments of escape if we can't mitigate that sensory overwhelmness. The third, the fourth point is compartmentalization, which is also about organizing space into manageable sections from the sensory perspective. The fourth, uh, the fifth point transition, which is to allow that moment for someone who is arriving from that big, noisy, chaotic sensory world and expected to come in to an act that requires focus like all of us did today. You can build in that spatial infrastructure of transition for someone on the spectrum to be able to make that adjustment and be more productive and more focused and more active and more engaged in the activities that they are expected to be part of. The sixth construct is sensory zoning. And again, as architects, classically, we're trained to organize our buildings around the utility and the functions of our spaces and group things together based almost entirely on efficiency and function. And what I ask for is to layer on top of that also sensory zoning. So not only to think about, for example, classrooms as classrooms, but to think about what is happening inside those classrooms, what's the sensory quality of what's happening there and organizing quiet spaces next to quiet spaces, noisy spaces next to noisy spaces and putting some transition in between. 
And finally, of course, safety, which is something we always have to think about moving through some of the spaces yesterday with Chris. Um, I'm very much aware of the safety when you move through space with a perspective that is not necessarily normative. And that's very much the case also with the autistic perspective. So the aspects design guide luckily and through the generous contribution of many people's now being used all over the world is being taught in different studios, different architects have adopted it in their own work. I've designed projects all over the world as well. So we've had almost two decades of experience testing this out in different constructs. And one of the spaces that I most recently had this conversation about the aspects design index was at the Chicago Architecture Biennale in 2021. And the theme of the Biennale was, or the theme of the panel that I was sitting on was architecture for the people. And it's interesting that Jordan mentioned this idea of democratization of the architectural process and architecture for the people is very much a terminology of democracy. And being in the United States, of course, there was a lot of debate. Is it, democracy, is it architecture for the people, which looks at people as objects? Is it architecture by the people, which looks at people as agents of change, perhaps? Or is it architecture with the people, which looks at people as a process? But the word that I was more concerned with in that whole debate wasn't the for, by, or of, but it was the people. So this slide here is a little sketch I've done of a human at the center of a circle. And I'm more concerned with who is that person at the center of the circle. We talk a lot about human-centered design and the importance of human-centered design. But the problem I'm finding with engaging with human-centered design is we have not agreed who that person is in the middle. We have spoke about the six foot tall white male. I would add to that six foot tall, able-bodied, seeing, hearing, moving, speaking. Um, socially uh, comfortable white male. So <laughs> that is the person we think about at the center of the circle. And any, anyone who deviates from that is outside of the circle. So my work is about maybe stretching that explanation of who, who is human when we say human centered, who is people when we say architecture for the people, and to make sure that that definition is as diverse as our reality of the human fabric that we actually. Um, exist in. And finally, one of the things that I've learned in having the great privilege of working with all the individuals on the spectrum that I've worked with around the world and have engaged with me in my work is I like to think of the human-centered philosophy of empathetic design not as empathy, because a lot of times Nikolai and I were talking about what people really mean when they say empathy is sympathy. And there is this unavoidable hierarchy of power structure of us and them. And although we delude ourselves that we are thinking empathetically, we really are only thinking sympathetically because it's so hard to remove the privilege of ability from engaging in these kinds of dialogues. So what I try to push myself in my work is move past even sympathy and empathy and move towards expertise and really consider flipping that hierarchy entirely and not thinking of myself or our field as the experts, but rather the user, whoever that person at the center may be, blind, deaf, tall, short, able-bodied, moving, autistic, neurodiverse, challenged with mental health, whatever that description or category or intersection is, that is expertise that we are there to learn from. And one of the most beautiful in my experience examples is the video that I just ran, which was developed and designed by a wonderful autistic artist that I've worked with, uh, Stuart Nielsen. And during the pandemic, Stuart was spending a lot of time, of course, locked down at home. He lives in Ireland, looking out his window using his camera, he uses his camera as a lens as an autistic person to view the world. It helps him filter and edit out certain things and then he can take a post experience edit and reformulate images. And he created this overlay of the view of birds, seagulls moving through the space around his city. And because of his autistic mind and the expertise, he was able to recognize a pattern of their movement that he uncovered was actually a reflection of the city's urban fabric and streetscape. So that pattern that you see the birds mapping in the sky is actually a reflection of the street network underneath 
in the city, which the birds had discovered was a way for them to find food during the pandemic when the streets were abandoned and there was refuge and trash on the streets that they could go down and pick and find food in. And this is all from the expertise of the brilliance of the autistic mind. And I think like Chris's canoe or <coughs> boat rowing in the river, if we think of our architecture and our role as architects, as dismantling this power structure of expertise that comes from us, and rather look at expertise that comes from all users with their diverse abilities, we can create these canoes for everyone to be in that is a space where they are excellent and they are able rather than being disabled. Thank you. Thank you so much, Magda. Um, what uh, an excellent uh, way to end the first uh, session. Um, we are now uh, up for a very short break. And um, so it's, it's five minutes, five plus minutes. Uh, and uh, I want to see you all back here at uh, 1040. And then we will uh, continue with the with the panel discussion. Before I leave, I just uh, you know that group, you are just going to say a little bit about yes, the I afternoon would program. Just very briefly like to um, point your attention to the fact that in the afternoon, we have these lift experience workshops or activities where you can, for example, engage in a tour in a wheelchair or walk through the library space with Chris and um, Lily, she also um, organized or um, is leading a tour. And you will, we will meet in the afternoon in the library. You see that in the program and we very much hope that you will come and share the experience with us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. But uh, please uh, do come back in five minutes and then we will have um, discussion with all this uh, very interesting perspectives. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. We are back for the uh, second session and uh, panel discussion where we'll try to kind of uh, get into some, I think, questions across this very, very different perspective. 
And um, I think I will uh, start by uh, inviting a couple of uh, students as well into the panel. So we have the student perspective here. Ruth, Ruth can you just shortly introduce our two students? Yeah, I just wanted to give them a chair and I was about to destroy <laughs> the furniture here. Um, we have two students. Um, there's Annalena Sass. She's an architecture student from um, Copenhagen. And there is Paula um, Schieter, who is a student in Freiburg studying. Um, oh, you have to help me again because management. change management and informatics. And they are um, part of the UIA youth track. And we are very happy to have them here also contributing to the discussion. So please um, go ahead. And I also wanted to point out the fact that um, for the audience we have online, there's the possibility to put, um, to put questions into the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. Um, it's a very long panel now. <laughs> I'll be out here on the side. Okay, I think we should uh, try to to start where we kind of ended with you, Magda, and um, the question of who we are designing for. Um, you talked about the need for a new understanding of the human and a more inclusive understanding of the, the human and human-centered design. But I think it's an obvious question that listening to all your very diverse perspectives, is it really possible to design for everybody? Is there such a thing as truly inclusive design? Do you want me to answer that one? <laughs> I would like to at least start with a reflection on that one. The hardest question. Um, I don't know necessarily if it's possible, but I don't think that should be a reason why we don't strive towards it and in striving towards it, because we still are, a lot of these fields are very much emerging and especially the conversation across us is very much emerging. So I hope that in striving to do that, you figure out some solutions, but to be more practical rather than abstract. Um, Chris and I have spoken in the past with another colleague of ours who works on deaf space and deafness because the three of us kind of engage with the sensory world. And I do think there are ways for you to focus on very simple, specific things like entry sequences and entering a building. So Chris talks a lot about like the doorknob and being how a building meets you. Um, I talk a lot about how moving from the outdoor space in the sensory world to an indoor space needs a certain element of transition. So I think if we start focusing on those moments and, and thinking about them through different experiences, some of the solutions that I'm finding helps work because you do find conflict where by taking one person's needs into consideration, you actually create a barrier for another group. And there you can build in some agility into the design. You can have some choice, some flexibility, some adaptability, technology can help support. But it is definitely an area that we need to focus so much more attention to. I do think it is it is possible in, in moments. It may not be possible in its entirety, but without us starting at least this effort, we won't figure out where those gaps are so we can start having a conversation and addressing them. Can I jump in? Yes, yeah, sure. And please just, you know, uh, give me a sign that you want to jump in. So it's, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I just, you know, to, to follow up on what Magda was saying and on your question, I mean, I think we're not even trying mm -hmm. to, to do inclusive design. I mean, the education that, I mean, I just look at the curriculum that I've been exposed to from my own, which was a complete disaster. And I'm kind of constantly unlearning since I've been educated as an architect um, in, in Marseille on the, you know, in, in the shadow of Corbusier um, and the, the infamous modular. So, you know, mm -hmm. to go back to that figure that we talked about. Um, but then also just looking at the curriculums that I have um, been exposed to as faculty from ETH to the GSD and now APFL. I mean, there is not a single class on inclusive design whatsoever. I think there might be like uh, points. So we actually talked about this just earlier, how certain school would invite faculty as you know guests um, to do some studio on, you know, uh, 
inclusivity, whatever that means, to fulfill what I talk about when I talk about these facades of progressism. Um, but then these people are not tenured. Uh, the curricula doesn't have that enshrined in its, it's not a fixed class. I mean, I don't know, maybe we could actually ask you guys um, what's the situation with curricula, but um, it seems to me that we're not even trying, mm -hmm. at least in the university, it doesn't feel that way. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Good idea. So actually, we do have something about inclusivity in uh, architecture. Like I just had a semester last semester. The thing is, even though they try to have a focus on it, sometimes at least, what you really notice is that there's a huge lack of knowledge. So even though it was supposed to be a theme, we didn't really get out of it as much as we hoped for. So the focus really quickly kind of drifted away from what it was supposed to be. Um, and our project ended up answering a whole different question than it was supposed to. That's a lack of knowledge from the faculty and from the teachers. And that's a big question. I mean, how much do we, should we expect the teachers to know about this? Um, problems when they teach us because I think there's totally a lack of education there. Yeah, Chris? Yeah. Uh, to follow up on that, uh, it, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, one, the, the comment of the, the uh, lack of knowledge, uh, and that that reminded me of something I constantly refer back to, and it's a uh, an essay by uh, the executive director or CEO of the Ford Foundation in New York City, uh, who is uh, in fact himself a, a gay uh, African-American male uh, who prides himself on awareness on diver diversity and inclusion. And in the announcement of their new Ford Foundation uh, 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 philanthropic guidelines, all about embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion, he quickly got lambasted for the failing to include any people of disability within it. And it made him think back on a civil rights leader in the United States, uh, James Baldwin, who wrote that ignorance is the, is the enemy within. And it's the idea that through ignorance allied with power is, is sort of the most pernicious uh, uh, possibility there is. And that idea of the ignorance <laughs> it's a less kind way of saying lack of knowledge. I prefer that as a more constructive term, but can, he had to face his lack of knowledge, his lack of awareness of people with disabilities that hadn't been part of his world. He had to admit to his own, his own privilege uh, and, and not having experienced that himself. And that created in him his own blind spot of, of that a different kind of human experience. So that opened up a whole new uh, revision to their 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 guideline and a really profound statement. Uh, if he, everybody can go look for that, Darren Walker, 2016 Ford Foundation, you'll you'll get the statement. And it's all about social justice uh, and architecture in this aspect. Uh, and for me, back to the original question, uh, as I explained to you, uh, Nikolai, I take it somewhat as an as a unicorn, the idea of inclusive design or in universal design. It's really complicated. It's complicated by our lack, lack of, of knowledge. I would, especially in this setting, I would take it to say that perhaps that lack of knowledge is the lack of inclusion of this diversity within our schools of architecture, where we learn attitudes, where we learn uh, all sorts of things that guide our thinking, guide our quest for knowledge and expertise over time. And if we don't have students around us as peers to, to serve as those, those teachers, uh, those uh, friends that silently teach us through their experience just by being around them, then we're perpetuating that sort of narrow-minded and, and more limited, uh, less uh, knowledgeable uh, experience of the human condition. So what did you say? Yeah, sorry, Lynn. Oh, no, I just wanted to comment on the lack of knowledge. I mean, it seems to me that one of the things that I found is maybe one of the things we can be doing in the first instance is actually making the time and space for inquiry to happen. Um, certainly when I was a student, there wasn't time and in practice there's even less time. 
Um, and I mean, one of the great things um, I found working on Feral Atlas is there was a lot of time because it was made. Um, but of course there was, I mean, this project was supposed to take two years, it took five years. Um, you know, meetings that were supposed to take an hour took half a day. And this was amazing because it allowed for the kinds of conversations to happen and for questions to be asked where it reached the point where it's like, oh, we don't know. How do we find out? Who do we ask? How do we inquire? And I mean, this is one of the things that it seems like in architecture we never have is, is time mm -hmm. and space to do yeah. this. I think it's interesting now we are on a school of architecture here. Um, and I'm not from here and I'm not an architect. Um, and no one here in the panel uh, is from this school. But, um, and I don't know the state of, of, of this subject in this school, but I know Charlotte, if you've, based on your long experience working with structural strategic change of large institutions like this. If you should summarize, what would be the, the main, your main recommendations uh, for, for a school like this? Where, 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 is it, uh, where, do, where do you see that change is happening? What should you learn? I mean, I don't know about this school because no, I know no one is, no, of us knows about this school. So we can talk to the, the need to kind of think also locally and specifically because each school has its own kind of uh, set of power dynamics and also a different um, uh, kind of direction as well. So locally matters. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I would to be honest there is so much to change, you know? Um, I think that there is something that you can see and detect in this conversation is that, for instance, um, the faculty very often doesn't actually, or even like the, the question of how much do we as designers uh, reflect the societies we're designing for, I think is one of the key elements. So in a way you, you try to have, usually you have quite a diverse, student body, but then that doesn't really um, mirror itself into the faculty because it's power, it's a pyramid. So of course, we know when the air gets thinner, it's back to white male central. <laughs> so that doesn't you know, kind of work. So there is a change that has to happen also in the demographics of schools. Um, but Ultimately, we're looking at changing the profession and the way it operates and what it does as, you know, kind of serving an economy, which is impatient, for instance. So this question of time is something that also percolates across the culture of architecture. So high end, the kind of like the kind of capital fueled investments that ask for like a building to be constructed within a year. That means, you know, cheap materials extraction, uh, exploitative labor, and goes down to like the culture of the all-nighter um, in the school. So I think if you want me to say what well, has to be changed, I would say everything. <laughs> Great, yeah. Um, we have, where are you pointing? The panel is, they have. Jordan? Jordan and Angela, maybe they want to. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you, yeah. <laughs> but Jordan, you're working with, uh, um, in your think tank, working with the uh, teaching as well, um, and and their accessibility uh, at school at schools of architecture. So what is your point of view in this matter? Yeah, I mean, so my, my my research into the course at the Architectural Association sort of I think is very pertinent to this because, um, and Andrew Walker, you know, he he was a tutor at the AA before he became disabled in the sort of eighties. <laughs> he then became disabled and returned to the school a few years later. Um, to a completely changed space where it was no longer suitable for him really to work in properly. Um, and that was more a case of him adapting to the school rather than school adapting for him. Um, and I think what that speaks to is the fact that the reason we have, for example, so few disabled academics or tutors or staff or anything is because a lot of the time we are expected to do a lot more labor in these institutions than anyone else in order to, to gain access or to work on the same level. Um, so I think it's as much a spatial thing in schools as it is institutions improving how they can support staff to get into these roles and while, while they're in them as well. 
Um, so that's that's sort of what I learned from the AA. Um, and then yeah, you mentioned the think tank. So we're starting this in um, in November, um, and it's really sort of trying to bring the things that we discussed today to the forefront of the students' um, knowledge. Really, what, what can they delve into to understand disabled communities, disabled needs in relationship to cultural spaces? Um, and we know we're looking at the work of Amy Hamway over in America. Um, as well in terms of how you map access, how do you understand it, how does it become a, a collective process rather than just put on the um, shoulders of disabled people themselves, uh, how do we engage collectively through that labour? Um, and I think that's another important point too, is that everyone should be learning about this. I mean, I, for my education, never had a specific lecture conversation about access, which I think is um, insane, really. <laughs> Um, through five, six years of education. Um, and the only time I did start to focus on it was through my own um, experiences. Um, so schools have a lot to do. Um, and you know, this network we're trying to establish is hopefully trying to address that as well. Yeah, thanks. I don't know if there are actually anyone from the school here who wants to make a comment on this. Yeah. I, I found it uh, very interesting to hear you talk across the many different um, perspectives that you're bringing together. I thought your slide with the Swiss men is a very wonderful caricature, but it's also very funny. Um, and I think maybe what's at stake here is really a question about um, the practices of architecture. What those Swiss men have been taught is that they know what architecture should be. And what Magda and all of you, what Magda very clearly says when you talk about your uh, prototypical classroom is that we cannot know and we should not assume to know. And this changes really our role as architects from being someone in an isolated chamber, designing out the world and giving it in those men, now they're presenting their model <laughs> and, and sort of giving it to to the public, but rather to be engaged. And this, so what needs to change is both maybe the politics, the hierarchy, but also the practices that we are somehow, we don't leave the building, but the building is something that is continually constructed, continually programmed. Can I just pick, yeah, pick up on that um, to Meta's point about, I think one of the things you talked about that there's almost a delusion there that we think we know, and that is a very dangerous space to be. And I think one of the ways to go back to what Charlotte was saying about curriculum, I think we need to engage with language. I find that as a teacher, how we define things and how we speak about certain things makes a huge difference. So for example, diversity, Chris talks about Darren Walker defining diversity through his lens as a gay African-American man in the United States leading a philanthropic institution, that is a certain specific perspective. But when you say that that is a diversity and inclusion initiative and delude yourself that you have been completely inclusive only to realize that there's a whole millions of people that you excluded from that conversation. So I think language can be very dangerous, but it also can be very, very liberating. Um, and the reason it's important is language relates to legislation and policy and codes and standards. So for example, when you say a building is accessible, what do you actually mean? Typically what you mean is that it's code compliant and that it's ticked all the boxes and it's legally allowed to exist. But as an American colleague tells me, code compliance really is only as bad as your building is legally allowed to be. So I think when we think talk about compliance with our students, we need to also layer on top of that a sense of responsibility that it isn't only to tick the boxes because legislation and policy and codes and standards do not include any of the perspectives that we talked about today. So there's obviously a gap, but at least as educators, we have a responsibility to inform our students that they have a responsibility to challenge that, that code compliance is not enough, that you need to make sure that you're responsible and you're creating something that's expansive. And when you say you're being diverse or inclusive or accessible, what do you actually mean when you say that? And how is it that you're engaging in that. And to Meta's point about practices, even our methodologies are very exclusive. 
So I've had clients that say, well, we don't have any autistic employees or we don't have any deaf employees. Well, that's because you ran a focus group around coffee for lunch and your autistic employees are challenged when it maybe comes to social uh, public speaking and couldn't join that focus group or you did a focus group, uh, I don't know, um, with, with text on the wall and someone like Chris is not going to be able to read that text if you don't make it available ahead of time. So even the practices that we have that we call research, focus groups, interviews, behavioral mapping are very normative. So they're inaccessible to the very voices that you have deluded yourself that you think you're being inclusive of. But if you don't rethink the model and the method that you're using to make it itself inclusive, then you'll just get the same voices that are able and verbal and social and moving and seeing and hearing, and you're just reinforcing it and then deluding yourself that you're being inclusive. So I think it, we really have to unpack those terms and those practices. Yeah, and Jordan, I know you have a, a comment, but it, I think that even when you try to, to be inclusive, um, I think there is a matter of, it's often about having one uh, representing a minority standpoint. Uh, and and I, I would also like some of you to, uh, to reflect on that because how is it to be invited to, to to um, um, to talk for a whole group uh, in in these processes, and can we do it completely another way around? Um, uh, I think I think that's and and when it just to, to to make it even more complex, when you you talk about this intersectionality, this intersectionality, you you also you also talk about it's this uh, plurality of identities within one person. We are not just only one thing. And how do we deal with that? So if we have these mechanisms of inclusion and exclusions, um, it, it becomes very, very complex, uh, very quickly, uh, if, if we have to represent every kind of identity. So, uh, Jordan. No, I just wanted to quickly add to make this point about language here. And then I was at an event a couple of months ago where Joss Boyce, who some of you may know, who's a quite a prominent researcher in the UK, um, sort of spoke about accessibility and inclusion uh, as language and kind of criticized them in that they denote in a way this idea of a power structure as in we include you or we give you access which I think is, was a quite a poignant point for me to think about in that way because it's, it's terms we use today and, and generally in, in our work um, but to think of it in that way it kind of makes us really challenge the, the power that, that those words have who is it that's offering access? Who is it that's offering inclusion? Um, and how do the people that are being given access and being given inclusion um, actually take agency of that themselves? I think Magda spoke us of, do we use of or with or by? Um, I think those, those words are, can actually be very important in defining that relationship. Okay, Ruth. I would like to connect to what Charlotte and Lily said um, earlier. Um, because I think with all the different panelists, what has, has been said, the underlying current is the power structures and that they need to be changed. And I think it's very often it comes as if the architect is in charge of everything, but we were talking about the time issue. We were talking about investment, interest, real estate, what have you. And in this respect, I would like to put a, a question to Angela about these informal settlements, because basically you're talking about those who live there who have least power at all. And I'm wondering how they are empowered or how you work with this absolute um, imbalance, <clears throat> imbalance there and how you can potentially empower them in order to make a difference. Uh, thank you. So <clears throat> first, let me let me give you the idea that uh, when I talk about Musex, I'm talking about more than <clears throat> almost half of the urban territory in the entire country, and it is the same for the majority of the African countries. That's why every time people see an African city, all you see it's a mess. 
okay, because it's an urban context that not even us are fully aware of how it functions, of um, all how this social um, fabric, uh, not fabric form, uh, in terms of how people are related or connected to the territory, how they use it, how is this, um, uh, how, how, how is it possible for us to understand its nature, its foundations? And um, the, the, the beginning of the reflection is how, if, he, if it was possible to have an inclusive design. And of course it is, because um, the answer, the, the, the key word is diversity, because we need to go uh, we need to 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 think outside of the box, okay? And inclusiveness has to be an approach based on the recognition of the diversity of the city. And uh, let me explain that. Um, the, when you see a mosaic, and this is something that needs to be mentally um, uh, um, put aside in our politician minds and even in our architect mi architects' minds. It's the idea that those areas are to be eliminated from the urban fabric, like something like a disease, okay? And uh, the idea and the bigger question is how to include these mosaics into the city. And the answer is to upgrade those areas. But the, 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 the question is that we don't know how to do that, okay? And um, since, let me give you an information because I think it is important for you to have it, that for the last decade, there has been a line of studies by African architects and urban planners about a contemporary African city. And we are creating, as we speak, new instruments, new canons, and we believe that we are on the right path to initiate the change. And without a doubt, it starts by changing the curricular narrative because after more than 20 years of university uh, work as a teacher, as a researcher, I have no doubt that the answer to the challenge of African cities is not the language of Western modernity or post-modernity. We cannot use the narrative of Le Corbusier or Frank Lloyd Wright to address our cities. It's a completely different perspective, okay? And um, to include so it, the, the design prior to, to, to intervene is to, uh, to understand. And after we understand that, okay, we can include. So this is my first reflection on the subject. I don't know if I made myself clear because um, it is important for me to, 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 to give you that perspective because the UN Habitat has this huge program about slum upgrading. And most of us are, uh, are eating sushi with a fork and a knife, okay? You need to use those sticks because otherwise, okay, you are going to eat, but you are going to make a mess. I don't know if I can make myself clear. I'm trying to use a metaphor because um, it's something that begins in the class. How are we, what are we teaching our future architects and urban planners and, and um, anthropologists? How, are, what are we teaching them? So this is my, uh, my, my first reflection on the subject and, um, and that's it <laughs> mm -hmm. as a first uh, approach to the subject. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, so we, if we need another architecture, we need new architects. That's really uh, at the bottom here. I would like to invite you all here to, to ask a question, or if you're sitting out there behind your screen and have a question, please uh, discuss. Yeah, we have one down there. Hi, um, my name is Kasia Pekarczyk. I was just listening to all of them, and thank you for offering all these perspectives. It's incredibly interesting to hear. Can you speak a little uh, bit louder? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, what I was wondering about, and it got me thinking, I think Magda's remark on the uh, research not being inclusive is, is just an open question. And I'm curious to hear all of your perspectives, actually, since the pandemic, when we all moved online, has that resulted in maybe perhaps a more 
like inclusive space for certain research or did it limit? Because I could imagine both ways and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Can I answer that yeah. quickly yeah. just because it was actually the pandemic that made us aware of the discrepancy in our tools because I use a lot of design thinking methods in the research that I do and work with aut the autism population. And we ran two workshops pre-pandemic, one with an organization in Ireland, one with Google in, in Switzerland. And then the pandemic hit and we ran another workshop remotely online. And the very first set of observations I got from the community that I was working with, and some of them had attended the live workshop and then the online workshop, was that the remote format for some people on the spectrum was a much more inclusive space because they had control and they had choice. So they had control over volume, they had control over the frame of what they needed to be looking at so they could zoom into certain sections of the screen where we were using like a whiteboard as opposed to an actual board. So they didn't have to see everything at once, they could focus. So there was that control, but there was also the different channels of communication. So if they were comfortable speaking verbally, great. If they weren't and they wanted to sketch and they were more of a visual communicator, that was available. And then there was chat that they were comfortable with writing and text. So there were different formats and then there was also time. So after we finished, the material remained available on that virtual board and they could go in privately on their own in a more comfortable, safe space to engage in a way without the pressure of that schedule. And it was very organized. And so there was predictability. They knew minute by minute what was expected of them, what we wanted, what questions we were going to ask and so on. So it ended up accidentally being like this social experiment and as a result, we developed a small rethink of the design thinking method from the autistic perspective and how we can even restructure it in real life and in real space so it would be more accessible to that cohort. But it was the pandemic and the remote world that prompted that discovery. Yeah, Chris. So um, from the blind perspective, you know, there's a lot of the technology that we use, the, the virtual platform that works well in terms of getting into it but um sort of the the inverse to sort of the the range of options available to some of the for the work that magda was doing i was thinking back upon doing a project for the washington state uh, school for the blind uh and in a point where we need to do uh, user group workshops with students at the school and wanted to share drawings all sorts of visual things because you can't you can't just show that on the screen in Zoom or Teams or whatever platform and expect someone who's blind to be able to have any clue what's going on. So we actually had to sort of transcend that virtual platform to in advance develop tactile materials that could be labeled in Braille or whatever, shipped to the, the students in their remote locations so that we could all refer to the same tactile elements in the conversation. So it does pose some challenges. Uh, also have the an experience currently working on another school for the blind that's being combined uh, on a campus with a school for the deaf and working with an architect who's deaf. And, uh, and, and he's been mindful of interestingly pointing out to me and the deaf community, they, they don't like using the Teams virtual platform because they only allow one or two a pen ability to pen a video up and they need to have the screen of what's going on the person talking and they need to have their interpreter up there so their interpreter needs to be pinned so by the time they get to their basic arrangement they've exceeded the number the maximum number of pen frames to have up to, to be able to see so you know it does pose some some challenges here and there it does enable a lot i've heard from friends and, and accounts of people with physical disabilities, being able to go to places, be part of social events and, and classes and various things that they could never go to because those places weren't physically accessible, but they could get there virtually. So that was a, a benefit. Um, I, I can just jump in. Um, I think there was also, I mean, there has been a moment when we all went online where there were also inequalities that were exposed um not everybody has access to a fast wi-fi reliable 
Um, not everybody has the right laptop. Um, and all these softwares are also, you know, problematic in the way they deal with access to licenses and um, costs. Um, so, and, and not to mention, you know, where are you gonna have that meeting? Um, I mean, I had a child at home. I had to like make myself a, an office in a closet and I was, <laughs> you know, kind of in that situation. And I know that for a lot of people, it was also not easy to, to manage that. So I think that they were also, I mean, we should not romanticize um, some of what had happened. Um, I think also what is interesting, and maybe it would be also interesting to, to hear um, other perspectives, but um, interestingly enough, there were a lot of like these technologies that were already used by disabled population that was suddenly became mainstream. Um, and it's also interesting to see what has happened as soon as people could actually go back in, in, um, in person, that this was kind of an urgency at times where, you know, this kind of technology was in again, like pushed aside. Fortunately, a lot of it has still, uh, you know, kind of penetrated. I think a lot of meetings happen without uh, presence and that's great. Um, and, and I would just say that for our work, um, there has been like a community that emerged. I mean, we do a lot of this shadow activism. So you can just meet with people that are really everywhere. Uh, for the parity front, I mean, that has been kind of, I would say, fundamental to be able to meet, you know, we meet once a month um, between, you know, people that are in the States to um, in Europe. So that's great. Uh, uh, so there, there has, there is also, of course, that positive side, but yeah, just to kind of also mitigate the um, kind of reliance on technology that I think we're not equally facing. Uh, I don't know if I can give my, yeah. my, may I? Okay. So from the perspective of, um, uh, of informal settlements, the pandemic accentuated the exclusion of its residents and um, all of the benefits that the colonial neighborhoods have until today, such as uh, water, internet, uh, electric lights, and uh, all of these, um, all of these um, benefits that are provided by a strong infrastructure that results in, of um, of public funding. All of these informal settlements are aside from those benefits, those urban benefits, and. Uh, the great challenge um, for 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 the population that lives in the in the Musex is um, it, it's about security. It's about family security, because one of the the big um, the big reflections that we that we had to 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 bring to our to to to, to our context, our academic context, was the family the, the house. The, 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 how, how can a family that are usually um, of, um, of, of six to eight, uh, to eight uh, individuals, how do they live in conditions that are uh, of sub-urbanity? Sub I think that word, I can use that word. How is it possible to, to do that? Because um, how can you contain uh, six to eight people indoors without a job, okay, without a possibility of doing uh, online um, um, online uh, uh, work, okay, and uh, with this with a way of life that is essentially done outdoors because this is how the majority of our population lives, the, the, the backyards, the street, it's part of the daily life. So when you, when you take that, with, um, when, you, when you forbid people to, to, to have access to that, you are cutting not only its livelihood, their livelihood, but also their way of living. And so the seclusion did not work because the population preferred to take the risk of the disease than to deal with the consequences of confinement. 
and uh, you probably had access to how the, um, uh, the population in African cities were dealing with the COVID and people were outdoors and everybody was like, oh my God, they're going to die. Well, God is probably an African one because we didn't, okay? Something was very good for us during the pandemic and the rate of, or the impact of the pandemic was extremely low, under 1%. And so by the time people realized that it was not that big of a risk in, well, of course, in terms, I am not uh, addressing the, the COVID pandemic um, as something uh, that, did not exist. I'm not a, an unbeliever. I do believe in that. But uh, I'm talking to you about what happened here. And so it did not work. People um, did not accept that. And for us, the, the answer to that lies on how the houses are being done. The, 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 the outdoor areas that people have inside their, uh, not outdoors, the backyards, the need to have what we call quintal, which is a place where people get together inside of the house. So how the house is designed. This was the main, the main, um, um, the main, the, the aspect that it, that was for us the more, the most important for, uh, to, to discuss and uh, which is very different from the European, from what you are saying, for example, it's, it's uh, the other way. So 180 degrees away from the, the, um, the, the European consequences of the pandemic. It was mainly, it was different, very different. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Okay, uh, Richie? Yeah, I actually have a question for Anna and Tor. So after hearing all of this, <laughs> do you have any tips? Like how how would you would like to to have these topics addressed in your education? What would be helpful for you? Yes, for sure. Um, I think it's a bit as Magda said earlier as well, and how you teach uh, debunking who's the expert. The teacher shouldn't be the expert actually so that you get the actual experts in facilitating different kind of inclusion so it doesn't come from the privileged point of view all the time because all of my teachers at least males 50 60 years old like the standard package everything and i have never had it as a topic i've only learned about inclusivity through my own research and through the building code which is a very poor teacher and I think that we need to, it needs to be rethought how you address education uh, from not a, the, the teacher is the one responsible for teaching. That he's just a facilitator also in the curriculum and what you include and not include. You can choose some stuff, but make sure that you get different perspectives uh, and other experts in the field early. Yeah. And do you want to add stuff? Yeah, I think maybe there is something we can do when it comes to access to knowledge like of course we have the people who know and maybe we should like get them to teach us more but maybe this should also be more of a like database that's the same for most schools where you can access the knowledge others have gained through different experiences or through different projects maybe that would be a good idea and a little comment on the online part i think <laughs> uh, online education it has something to offer it might include quite a few that haven't been included before but it also poses a few like problems because i don't know a lot about it but uh, they might not they might be included online but wouldn't it still like pose a social um separation that they are online and the rest are not like if we now had a both online and physical classes happening at the same time wouldn't those then be socially excluded still and yeah how can, could we like fix that how would we include those who might not feel comfortable socially here but should really be included anyways Thank you so much. And I'm just realizing that we are actually running out of time. Um, 
So we have to kind of uh, wrap up and uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you. I think it's been amazing to hear all these very different perspectives. And I think that one uh, all conclusion is that we have to be much better at acknowledging these differences and bring them into the industry and the processes and uh, the schools of architecture. Um, and, and uh, in order to, because we cannot, uh, um, we cannot, you know, these dynamics of exclusion and inclusion will always be there as long as we are so varied and, and, and different people. Um, so we just have to be much more aware of them and, and how to, to, to work with them. Um, it's been very inspiring, we can go forever, but, um, but we have to be out of here because it's a festival and there's another activities going on here in a very few minutes. So lastly, I will just give the word to, to Ruth and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, it's been wonderful to, to be part of this um, again. Ruth. Again, thank you very much for being part of it. Um, I was told that there was some kind of discrepancy about the um, meeting time for the lift experience workshops, what we put up here and what is in the, in the program. And I would just like to, to um, confirm that the program um, is the, when we says when we meet precisely. Also after the, sh um, the, the sessions, we want to share our impressions again in another very informal talk. So you're warmly invited to both. And thanks very much. Thanks to the panel, to a very diverse and very interesting discussion. And again, uh, the idea was to kind of make the path for the UIA Congress um, in Copenhagen next year in July. So I really hope that I will see so many of you again next year. Thank you very much. And thanks to um, Angela and Jordan who, um, who attended online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. See you later. See you later. Hello, Jordan. Angela. Yeah. Bye bye. Talk to you later, Sally. Out. <laughs>